Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. Hey, man, thank you for your time. I know you you guys have a new album, and it actually bungled, I think, the, the last time we were supposed to meet up. I, I had issues with the software, and it kind of screwed things up. So sorry about that, but glad we could connect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So tell me about the live uh, lightning. How did you guys come to the uh, agreement that you needed to put this record out? I mean, it's great compilation of uh, banging tunes from the band's back catalog. Uh, well, it, it all started actually with a phone call from uh, Tom Mathers, the president of Paris Records. Uh, mm -hmm. He called me and asked me if uh, you know we were thinking about doing a studio album because he heard that we were writing some material. And we had been writing some material for, for a while. Before COVID, we, we were in the studio writing and then COVID hit. And then everybody basically, you know, kind of took a break for two years. Right. And, uh, we got back together and we started writing. And then when he called me, he said, are you guys going to do something with that album? I said, yeah, but we're not ready yet. You know, we've got uh, we've got five solid tracks and we're we're, uh, we're we're demoing about another six or seven right now in the process. And he said, well, if you, you know, you got any other ideas? I said, well, yeah, you know, I have three, three, uh, three live concerts that I recorded that we recorded over uh, you know the course of about a year with our engineer and I said and I've listened to a couple of them they sounded sound really good I said maybe I could you know go through the shows and and pick out the best songs and maybe we could do a live album and kind of use it as a springboard to the mm -hmm. new studio album and so he was totally 100% on board with that he said man that's a great idea that'll give everybody a chance to know that you know Babylon ID is back mm -hmm. and actually kind of give us a a talking points for the new studio album that came about that's basically how okay. it all came so you said three shows, right? That you guys had in the can. Uh, how many songs did you cull to kind of put this collection together? On the three, on the three uh, shows that we had recorded, there was sixteen tracks. You know, because a lot of them you didn't play hammer swings down. You know, you sure. didn't play all the time. Right. So mm -hmm. there was sixteen tracks. Um, it became pretty, pretty obvious pretty quick that. Uh, one of the shows just didn't sound that good. You know, it just didn't, it just didn't have whatever the special, you know, magic mm -hmm. need for a live show, but the two other ones, you know, and maybe because we had played them pretty close together, maybe within a four or five month period, you know, um, they sounded really, really good. Just right off the, just right off the board. Like they were, they just sounded really good. There was hardly no mistakes at all. Um, the guitar tone sounded good. The drum sounded, you know, great. My vocals sounded good. Um, and that's really the most important. If your vocals sound pretty good and the drums mm -hmm. sound good, you know, you can manipulate the uh, the EQs on guitars and things like that. You know what I mean? To make them fatter, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you want to do. But um, so we basically it, it came down to two two shows and uh, we sat and we listened to all the tracks and we we came up with 14 of what the songs that we thought were the best representations of the shows. Okay, nice. Yeah, I know you said the you know the the one thing you look for is vocal and and drum sound and stuff in a live recording and stuff like that. How much how much overall sweetening was done to this thing? Because it sounds genuinely live. Not not much. I mean, you know, you're gonna. So now nowadays when you record live, you know, you're not just recording on a two track. You're recording on, off the board, and the board may have mm -hmm. twenty four tracks. So I've got the, you know, the guitar split left and right. When mm -hmm. I sit down, I've got all the drum tracks. You're sitting sitting here with 12 drum tracks. You know what I mean? The cymbal, the right. hi-hat, the right. ride. You listen to everything. So you're mixing it together. You know, it's not already mixed into a two track. Mm -hmm. you know? So you're you're basically mixing the live version of what you got. Right. Um, so th that's basically how it's done nowadays. You know, um, there was a couple songs. I think there was about four songs where, where the guitar sounded kind of thin. But mm -hmm. it was weird because it was only it was only uh on on uh one of the concerts that we did recording for some reason one of the guitars just sounded thin you know it just mm -hmm. sounded squeaky like you know right. so we had to manipulate that and fatten it up with EQ and you know that kind of thing uh, we didn't have to play anything over or anything or call somebody up and go hey you know you made a mistake on this thank God because you know I would have felt uh you know it just felt kind of kind of weird if if uh, you right. know if it wasn't all there and and. To me, to be honest with you, man, it was really surprising how uh, how how tight the band is and how how there was hardly no mistakes at all. I mean, I hear them every once yeah. in a while, and the guys hear them, but yeah. when you just listen to the album, it's almost like, yeah, that mistake's good. I'm glad it's there, you know. Right, right. It's, it's 
just so small or subtle, or maybe yeah. the speed changes with the drums or, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, it's a live gig, you know? Yeah. And I think that's kind of what, what you just described is kind of what I hear that it, that that's what makes it sound like a genuinely live record, mm -hmm. you know, unlike yeah. the guys on your t-shirt, <laughs> you know, a live one and two, right? I mean, they're basically in studio kind yeah, of enhancements and I stuff. But, but what, right. a, what a shock that was when you were a kid and you find I out. I know it. What? My favorite album? <laughs> I know. What a, what a bummer. But, you know, it still captures something there. I mean, oh, yeah. it, it was a great introduction to live music, I think, for a Absolutely. lot of people. Yeah. So uh, what's it mean to you to be uh, reconnecting with Paris Records? Because, you know, they've had this history with, with this genre of hard rock and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, it's probably a good pairing for the band, I think. I think so, because uh, we were on Frontiers. We put our last album out, Revelation Highway, on Frontiers in like uh, about November, I think it was, of 2017. And mm -hmm. we did some touring and things like that. But, you know, uh, Frontiers has a lot of bands, you know, in our genre, just a lot of them. So they don't have enough time to give you all the, um, you know, to give you all the space that you need uh, to give you the yeah. promotion and the publicity and things like that you need. But uh, I've known Tom for quite a few years because we, we did a... Um, we did our our demos that we right had, mm -hmm. you know what 15 20 years ago or something like that right We've known him for a long time you know and um he's distributed a couple of our our lives our different albums and things like that mm -hmm. so he's you know we, we talk about once a year or something like that mm -hmm. um and what i like about his record label is his focus on just like you know one two three bands like when we talked about this he said okay derek here's what we can do when we when we put this together i'm going to focus on three bands and that's it and then when you guys do your studio album, it's going to be just, I'm going to focus on three bands and that's it. I'm mm -hmm. not going to go out there, and, you know, do, cause he's done, you know, 10 bands a year, 15 right. bands, things like that. You know, you're just throwing shit at the wall, hoping it mm -hmm. sticks, right. you know, but, uh, so that's what convinced, convinced us, you know, talking to the guys I said, let's right. just go with it's Paris. They might, you know, not have the big budget or whatever, but we're going to get more attention paid, paid to us, you know? Right. Which I get, you know, I think anybody that follows hard rock uh, music these days is is familiar with Frontiers and how they put out like, you know, 50 or, you know, 30 releases a week, it almost seems like. And, like you know, it. I think some some don't get quite the same amount of attention, you know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, how frustrating was that for you? You know, because I mean, here you guys roll out a new record, you believe in it, you, you work right. hard on putting the thing together and then it just kind of poof fizzles, you know. Uh, they gave us a budget budget for videos, right? And they mm -hmm. thought that we were going to do one one video, but I I know how to edit videos, mm -hmm. and I've got a lot of friends that have you know great cameras and video stuff. So I okay. took you know I said, look, man, you're going to give us this budget to do one video. I said I could do three videos out of this, oh. and they were like, well, that sounds great, but by the time we got, actually we did four videos, by the time we got to the third and fourth video, they'd already moved on from us. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was like they they probably gave us, you know, three weeks, four weeks or something. Mm -hmm. you know, and they were then they were on to something else, you know, uh, yeah. and that's just the way they are. Maybe they're like butterfly collectors. You know what I mean? They're just getting all right. the hard rock bands they possibly can sure. you know, on their label and look at us, you know, but yeah. it's not good for the bands, you know, because I know that was a great album. You know, right. Right. Uh, just real quick on that, because it was a solid record. Um, is that going to be pretty much a, the, the new material going to be kind of a continuation of where you guys went there? Uh, are you talking about the new music, you know, uh, as right. opposed to the last album is going to be kind of like the next step from that. Um, sonically, sonically. Um, you know, we, so I, John writes, guitar parts ron writes guitar parts and i mm -hmm. write guitar and do all the melodies and singing and producing and things like that so together we come up with a lot of different types of ideas a lot of different types of songs you know um and it just uh, depends on how you bake the cake uh, how hard you want it or, mm -hmm. or how um do you you know when, when you're mixing and producing and things like that you know we gotta you want to stay in the babylon ad grind right. although you might find a song that really doesn't sound like babylon ad but man that's a great song like right. when we had one million miles, the the mm -hmm. ballad on the, the the album. At first, the guys were like, "I don't know, man. You know, does this really sound like Babylon AD?" And you know, after we produce it and we they they play their heavy guitar parts because before they just heard it as a demo, 
Right. You know what I mean? Like an acoustic guitar, me singing, you know, and they're like, I don't mm -hmm. know, man. And I'm like, no, no, just when you guys yeah. put your guitars on there, it's going to be Babylon 88, you know? Right. And so that's kind of how we work. You know, we try to find the best songs, you know, um, that that's about it in a nutshell, really. Yeah. What's the timetable for the, for the new music, the new studio stuff? So we're hoping <clears throat> we're almost positive that at this time next year, there'll mm. be the, the new release will be out. You know, okay. um, I'm not saying we we're trying to be slow or anything like that, but we have a lot of dates that we got to play that we're doing for this record. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're still writing. Although I could be honest with you, I could say right yeah. now, we could start working on that record right now because we have the material. Okay. But okay. for me, like I told you guys the other day, I said, I hear two songs that if this was back in the day could be bonafide hits. Mm -hmm. And three of them that are great songs. And then the right. rest, it's like kind of filler. Well, you could get away with that, but we don't want, you know, you don't want to do that. Right. 10, 12 great songs, you know? So that's what we're shooting for. And we pra we've we been practicing every single weekend, uh, five, six hours a day. And uh, band's tight, man. The, the, the new songs are killer. I, I can't wait for people to hear them, man. They're going to be blown away. Hmm. Are you are you more of a fan of the classic kind of, uh, you know, album as, as far as put out eight, eight, nine of the best tunes rather than 15 and eight being great and then the other seven being filler? I, I that's what I get to. I, I to me, I hear I don't like songs that have fillers. That's why hmm. if we can get 10 right. that are great songs, then you're there. No sense putting on the other five. Like I said, we have another about seven or eight, but. They're just not great songs. They're good to me anyways. And to mm -hmm. some guys, they're like, yeah, that's a good song, but it's yeah. not good enough. And, you know, you could try to make it better, but right. usually usually if it starts out where it's a pretty good song, well, then it's going to stay a pretty good song. That's about it. Yeah. Is there yeah a I, I, I agree with you. I, I'd rather have yeah. less than more, but at the same time, sure, I want to get 10 strong songs. If we happen to get 12, that'd be great, but I don't want to put any filler on there. You know? Yeah. Is there a particular song that you can think of where where you guys worked and worked on it and then eventually became a great song? You know, like an example uh, that made any of the records that you go, oh, wow, we, that was laying around for a bit. And then we worked and worked on it. And then it finally became that great song that you're talking about. Well, um, in a way, Bangle the Bells was kind of like that. Um hmm. Because we arranged it a lot of different ways, a lot of different times. We you know, when we first started playing it, we, we had arranged a certain way, although we know we had a good, uh, really killer lick, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And a great chorus, we just the arrangement, you know, it, it could have been good like that. But when the producer came in, Simon Hanhart and the, the record company, and we sat and listened to different versions of the way that we could play it, we really worked on that song a lot. Hammer swings down, kid goes wild, desperate. Those songs kind of wrote themselves. They're easy to write. And uh, they, they kind of followed the script of, hey, this is this. We got it now. This is the arrangement. But Bangle the Bells, we we probably arranged that song about three or four different ways and, and recorded it three or four different ways till we said, no, this is the one. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So right. and that just started re really with a riff. Ron just playing the the uh, intro riff sitting in the kitchen and me sitting in a bedroom at an apartment in Los Angeles when we seven guys in one bedroom apartment. Wow. You know, and I heard him going down, da 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 yeah. Hey Ron, what's that? You know, shout. Yeah. He goes, I don't know. I'm just fucking. Well, around. it's a good thing. A good thing he was able to remember it, right? To to well, you I know recapture that. Yeah. I, well, I had a recording. I had a four track recorder in the bedroom. Uh -huh. Okay. That even though the guy, even though we were all sleeping on top of each other, basically, I had my little corner with some drapes up. I must have had about a five by five little spot, you know, in the corner. Mm. I had my recorder and I had my little bed. That was it. Right. <laughs> Oh man! Hey, you guys have a you you have a video uh, yeah. for to promote the release. Now, give me a little bit of background on on the footage for that. Was that from one of these shows that that made the that cut for kid, the album? Yeah, so that was that's Kid Goes Wild, and, and yeah, mm -hmm. so we just released that a couple of days ago. There's a single right. that just got released too. Actually, we haven't even promoted that yet. You know, we were promoting the record, but there's also a single for uh kid goes wild that just right. just released today too but we just you know you, you can only promote so many things in one you know in a week yeah right right so right. The video was released a few days ago um that was taken from uh four different shows um hmm. if i remember right fire fest uh uh i think uh Bauchum, germany i'm just going off the top of my head um right uh 
that Monsters of Rock cruise. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then a show that we did some of the live footage, some of the live album on. Okay. Right. Yeah, right. Live album on that was in California. So yeah, there was four, there was four shows that we took that took that from, um, and just kind of, you know I, I wanted to make it exciting. We could have just put one, just mm-hmm. took one show, and then right. the band playing, and then the, the the song is up. But to me, it's like okay, well, I've seen that done a billion times. You know, just so many right. times. It's like after about two minutes, people kind of use, lose their interest because it's just mm-hmm. the same. So what yeah. I wanted to do, splice together all the um, different concerts and the the stuff backstage, what we do, or you know. Mm-hmm. Or, just make it show the fans, you know, just make it exciting. That's what right. the point of that was. Now, I know you mentioned you do editing. Did you have a hand in this one? Yeah, I, I do all the editing. All okay. The, yeah, oh, wow. I mean, yeah, it basically started back with uh, when we did uh, Bangle the Bells 25 years ago. Oh, we, wow. We, oh, geez. So, uh, so, so you've been at it for a bit. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hands-on editing, just me only, has been about the last 10 years. Okay. You know? But before that, I would be with the editor, things like that. And, you know, I learned a lot of different chops and stuff like that. There's still stuff I'm learning every single time. And I'm always trying to think of a different creative idea to put in Mm -hmm. there that maybe I haven't seen before, you know, if I can do it, you know. But I don't have the big giant editing software and uh, studio that some of these major, major players have, you know, that are just like off the hook, you know, um, with special effects and stuff like that. You know, I'm a little bit limited, but my imagination, I think, kind of. It makes up for it, you know. Now you did. Now in the video, you did have because this kind of links it to the studio version of the of the of the song, right? You had a little cameo with some RoboCop footage in the live one. Like now, how video. how do you go how do you go about being able to do that without having any legal issues or anything like that? I mean, how, how well, is it is it is it time limited if you get a snapshot or a glimpse that you can you get know, away with it? It's basically the you know the 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 movie's been out forever, man. We really yeah. For I mean the uh, mm-hmm. song for it, um, it it's it's everywhere. It's uh, and I think that one actually might be public domain because I know one of them is that might be okay. Public. Anyways, okay. And I think to myself, you know what the what the hell are they gonna do? Hey, right. you, I'm stuck in a RoboCop in there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it was a, it was a quick little glimpse. So yeah, that that was a nice little added piece. Yeah, just so. a, trip, a little bit. Yeah. So getting back into some of the back history, I mean, you guys were on Arista, not the most rocking of labels, but what was the experience like, you know, and and did you have any apprehensions getting, uh, you know, get, when you got offered to be get signed to that particular label because they didn't have that reputation for supporting well, this kind of music? That was the trick, though, because that's how they sold it. And once oh. you start talking to Clive Davis mm-hmm. and he says you're going to be the next Aerosmith. You believe right. it. You sure. know what I mean? And yeah. he's he's like, yeah, well, we don't have no bands like you. That's what's different. That's why we're going to put all our apples into you, because you're the only rock band that we have. Mm-hmm. And for us, it was like, well, yeah, we could be on, uh, you know, Geffen or somebody else, and they got 15 rock bands. We'd be lost in the shuffle. So let's mm-hmm. do this. Right. That, that was the idea, you know. And then in hindsight, after you start understanding how the record label works and things like that, um, how the business works. You understand? Well, these people that are working at Arista, they don't really have rock and roll connections. They've got the Whitney Houston connections, you know, and they've got the, you know, Kenny G connections. They got soft this and, and you know, R&B mm-hmm. that, but they don't have every, every, every uh, record company needs to have a house of, of guys that are the promotional guys and publicity guys that that's their genre. Well, mm-hmm. they didn't really have anybody. They had right. to hire a couple people, outside people. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but we didn't know that when we went in, you know, we had no clue except for, Hey, Clive Davis said this. Right. You know, and, and, you know, they gave us a big giant fat deal, you know? So it was like, yeah. Yeah. At what point did you, did, did you start realizing that, Oh, wait a minute. We they were sent, they, they promised this or said that this was going to go this way. And then they were like, we're not seeing it. I'll, I'll tell you when that was. And it's actually kind of funny because we did, uh, Hammer swings down, mm-hmm. then we did Bangle the Bells, and then we were supposed to release Desperate. Okay. It was our big ballad. That and Clive loved that song. He'd always talk about it to me and think, oh, that we're gonna make this song the next dream on. You know, he'd say stuff mm-hmm. like that to me or some of the guys, you know. And so we really believed it. You know, we were like, this is it, you know. And we were waiting for that song to come out. We we got the video treatments, we were gonna 
do that. And all of a sudden, Orion pitchers called and said, Hey, we want to do uh we want to use kid goes wild for the trailer. And we want to, mm -hmm. we'll pay for half the video. Mm -hmm. And Eris is like, well, they're going to pay for half the video. There's $50,000 right there. Mm -hmm. And they're going to make you the trailer. You know, you guys can get in this movie. And, and then we're like, well, uh, what about desperate? Don't worry. We're going to do desperate no matter what. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And well, are you mm -hmm. sure? Yep, we're going to do desperate no matter what. So we said, right on, let's do it. So we did kid mm -hmm. goes wild. As soon as kid goes wild is out for, you know, a good two or three months or whatever. Right. All right, we ready to go do desperate? Ah, uh, well, you know the record company's kind of. It's been about a year now. Uh, it's. I think it's time to move on. We want you guys to go back in the studio and do the next record. That's mm -hmm. when it hit us. Like, oh mm -hmm. shit, man. Yeah. You know what if we would have had desperate? You know, because it's a great song, man. What mm -hmm. if we would have had a push on that one? You know, maybe our fortunes would have turned bigger than just being you know, in a movie. And another thing that we didn't like that really pissed us off was when we did Kid Goes Wild uh, in the movie, they took out Sam Kinison. Yeah. And, and without telling us. Oh. So, oh they didn't even tell us. Yeah. Until we seen the damn movie. And until we seen the trailer, the video, you know, we we're like, where's Sam? Oh, well, we can't have that. What are you talking about, man? You know, that's a good oh. story point. Oh, no, right. no. They swear in the movie. What? Why can't he swear on the song? You right. Know? Right, right. So that yeah. those two things really, you know. I'm, I'm not saying that Kid Goes Wild wasn't a, a great thing for, with the RoboCop thing because it did give us some, um, you know, some uh, visual vision of of like, well, put us on the map a little bit. But I think if we would have went with Desperate, a big right. giant, great ballad, mm -hmm. it might have so took took us to the you know the next level. Yeah, and I mean, you guys were definitely creating a buzz with that with the those tunes. I mean, I know you know pretty much a staple on KNAC. I know I'd go yeah. to Southern California, hang out with family, and always tune into that. And then over here in the Northwest, we had the the Z Rock, uh, oh, you yeah. know, satellite yeah. affiliate, and you yeah. guys were on there all the time yeah, i mean yeah, we did a lot yeah. of interviews with that. yeah so a lot a lot of good stuff happening there um just real quick you know moving on to the next record uh nothing sacred you you guys got a chance to work with tom Worman. i know a lot of uh folks that worked with him kind of piss on the guy I, and i don't know what that's about but what was your experience working with Worman? um we're, our experience is a complete opposite working with tom Worman was like a dream come true for me because when I was in high school and stuff in junior high school, when I first really got into hard rock, I'm looking at Ted Nugent, Cheap Trick, the babies, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, who's the guy that's, you know, Oh, this, who's this producer? I always look at the back of the album, you know, and, right. just, and it just seemed like Tom Worman was the guy, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and then he did girls, 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 you know, got him even more of the, the, right. you know, into the, the late eighties and stuff like that. And so, whenever they ask us, who do you guys want to do your uh, second album? And I was like, Tom Worman, man. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, he's got a, you know, you're on a, we'll be on a six months waiting list if you want Tom, cause he's got prior commitments. I said, I don't give a shit if he wants to do our band, if he'd like to. So he heard our demos of, of the, of the album. Right. And we were basically ready to go to the studio, but we had to wait for him about another six months. And, uh -huh. and that was one of the reason it took so damn long in between the albums. Right. It must have took about two years or something that kind sure. of, fucked us up too to be honest with you but we didn't think of it like that at the time you know we just wanted to work with tom warman but uh tom was a character man i mean his whole thing is uh uh the engineer does his thing and then mm -hmm. tom comes in and and sits in the chair and then well what do you guys think if we change this or do that kind of thing right and he'd always and he he actually complimented me and he said derek you know i gotta tell you something after the record was done he goes you and Nikki Six are the only guys I would ever co-produce a record with. I was like, no, get no. out of here. I swear to God. He goes, you guys are the only guys I've ever sat with through all the musicians and everybody I've ever been with. I don't care who it is. Ted Nugent, the guys in Cheap Trick, blah, blah, blah. He goes, but you guys got the ear to be your own producers. And after that wow. kind of gave me more confidence in myself to become mm -hmm. a producer and an engineer myself. You know what I mean? To know that right. he was totally honest with me about that. Um, but Tom was a... Uh, Tom was a trip, man. Every Friday night, it was Tom night. Oh. About eight o'clock, it turned into like, no, nah, we're not doing the record no more, man. We're just gonna party in the studio. You know? Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. So it was like a it was like a, a day off kind of thing. Kinda, you know, he'd come to the studio about maybe one, two o'clock, and maybe we'd go till about six or seven, and then next okay. thing it was 
it turned into mayhem. I don't want, I can't tell you all. Right, that. right. But, but, but it was a wild time. Huh? You can imagine it happened, yeah. but that was Tom night. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I think, uh, you know, that you are, you also do is I think you, you, you do some, some other projects, one of them kind of uh, delving more into the blues uh, realm. Uh, tell me how, about that and how, uh, what got your, your interest in blues music? Uh, well, I was in a band called Moonshine and that mm -hmm. was with Buzzy James and Craig DeFalco and uh, Mike Malone. And um, it was a, uh, managed by michael anthony um uh -huh. Van Hitton, you know yeah. um and we went into uh eddie's uh 5150 studios and basically made a whole album we recorded at a few different places too but i'd say the vast majority was was at, over at eddie's um house and it was all for free just because they believed in the band you know eddie mm. gave us studio time i mean we had uh you, you know it, it was it was surreal man to have somebody just say man we think you guys are this good and that and gonna go places we're just gonna do everything on spec doesn't matter you know what i mean mm -hmm. and uh michael anthony sang on the record and uh jane child sang and played piano on the out record you know oh wow yeah 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 and it was a great album but then the band fucking blew blew up broke up mm -hmm. you know everybody's head starts swelling hey we're playing these big gigs these big shows we don't even you know we, the record's not even out yet we're not even right. signed but we have a full album to go to anyone and mm -hmm. you know, you got the Van Halen guy is gonna give it or help you out. Right. You know, you're pretty much I'm gonna get a record deal, another one, you know what I mean? And this was right. after after Babylon AD started sure. fizzling out, you know. So I was kind of like riding like Babylon AD. Oh, now I'm over in Moonshine. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the difference? I still got a record deal. That was what's going on in my right. head. Sure, sure. So, anyways, uh the band fizzled out, man. But I had all the tapes, I had all the songs, right? right? And uh some years went by and I, and everyone that's ever heard the demos and, and the tapes have always said, Oh my God, man, this stuff is great. It's like the outlaws meet Leonard Skinner mm -hmm. at, uh, you know, uh, Almond brothers house or something, you know, Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Piano, slide guitar. And it's just right. such blues rock. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, so I called one of the guys maybe seven or eight years ago and I said, Hey man, what do you, you put this stuff out? What the hell? At least some people here. Yeah, go ahead. So everybody was pretty much, uh, up on that and you know we released it uh on a on a small little label you know we didn't really do any push or anything because it's really not a band anymore mm -hmm. it's just you got these great recordings mm -hmm. you know and it's like well they could sit on the shelf the rest of their lives or they could be put out so right. that's why i really and i really liked uh buzzy james guitar playing the way he played he mm -hmm. liked Dwayne Allman, number two. Oh, okay if you've seen this guy play you'd you'd shit your pants man um anyways um so i started playing slide guitar a lot you know and uh I got to where I was pretty good. So then I decided I'd do a blues album, you know, myself. And so yeah, you know, right, I took right. a drummer yeah. in the studio and we did a blues yeah. album. Then after that, yeah. I, got, I got the, the soul bug. You sure. Know, Bobby Womack and James right. Brown, Al Green, Marvin Gaye, Terrence Trent Darby. Yeah. I'm listening to these guys every day for about a year. And I'm going, you know what? I could do that. I bet I could do it mm. better. This is in my mind. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. So I got the B3 out and I started listening to their the sonic the reverbs that they use and the lyrical content and stuff and i put out a, a soul album revolutionary soul um i'm always experimenting with stuff man you know what mm. i mean right acoustic yeah. songs i got i got really really pop beatles type of songs okay but when it comes to babylon ad it's kind of like okay this is this is the avenue for that mm -hmm. this, you know i'm putting the uh, train on the tracks and i'm going down this avenue right you know I mean? yeah Couple more things, and then I'll cut you loose. Thank you for your time. This, is, this has been great. Um, do you have a good Eddie Van Halen story from using the use of the studio while you guys were cutting those tunes? Uh, no, I don't, because at that time I'd probably seen Eddie maybe twice, and mm. it was back in the time where he was having some uh, uh, some problems with uh, Valerie. I guess you know. I, I mean, I don't know all the politics. I don't really sure. You know, but right, but right. he was basically in the house a lot. How, put it okay down. okay but, it was in there. Alex was there every day um michael was there every day you know i mean uh wolfgang was just a little kid running around you know and that yeah. was badass right man, you know right I mean? that's got to be a trip thinking back to that right when you saw yeah. him walking around as a little kid and now he's a full-grown yeah. adult musician himself 
chasing after him. Yeah, come here. You know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. So last thing, and uh, thank you for your time again. Um, is there a particular factoid about Derek Davis that uh, we w- that you could share with us that we wouldn't know unless we were you or you mm. told us? Oh my God, man. I'd have to, that's like an, I don't know. I mean, a <laughs> factoid. Uh, um, I was, I was once in a low rider gang and I was part of a gang called the Mama Owls with oh. the cross tattoos. Particularly oh, geez. Parts. Well, uh, that's, that's something. Factoid. Yeah. That's yeah. factoid toad one. Fact type factoid two was, uh, about 10, about 10, 12 years ago, I, I, uh, I worked out quite a bit. I applied for different police departments and I got picked up on the Oakland police department. And I oh, was, wow. uh, I was, uh, with the OPD for about six months until I said, man, I must be crazy. Right. So, oh yeah, boy. So, and they took that... away my tattoos too. They said, you got to get away. The oh, really? Okay. The cover of my American Blitzkrieg. They said, "What is that? Some kind of white pride thing?" I mean, oh, like, jeez. Let me get this straight. I got American Blitzkrieg over here, which means white pride, and I got my Pachuco mark over here. Yeah, right. Mexican gang guy. <laughs> right. Hey, don't fit for you guys. I'm, right. I'm in Oakland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. <laughs> like oh wow. Pretty good. So yeah. Wow, yeah. what a trip! I, who knew? I didn't know that. Wow, that's 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 awesome. That's kind of a different kind of a career move for sure. Yeah, that was it was just one of those kind of things where when I was a little kid, that was what I wanted to be a police officer when I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. You know, nice. even though I can't stand authority, how crazy is that? Yeah, isn't that trip? <laughs> it's like <laughs> I want to be in control, man. <laughs> right, no kidding. So, uh, my wife and my my family all thought I was absolutely nuts, man, because you know it, it wasn't like I'm going with a uh, you know, another Bay Area place around here, mm-hmm. this city. I'm going with OPD. You know what I mean? Right. It's right. hardcore out there, man. Let me tell you. But I learned, yeah. you know, I must be crazy doing this. I better go back to music. I said to myself real quick. It's, it's probably a safer move anyways, yeah, right? It was a lot yeah. safer. Jeez. Hey, actually, man. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your time, man. Hey, we're going to plug the the record. In fact, I actually did a review for it for knac.com. So that's online. I think you guys shared it and stuff like that. So oh, yeah. um, we'll get this video up online as well. Share it with everybody. Thanks to you and Michael for making this happen. This was a blast. Yeah, awesome, man. Thank you very much. All right. Any, any, any parting words to the fans? Uh, I would just say, uh, you know, we're going to do some shows coming up if you can make them. Most of them are in California right now, but we're looking at some Midwest stuff. Um, you know, uh, we'll be announcing pretty soon. And just we use Facebook a lot. So, okay. you know, if you want to get a hold of so, us, use Facebook. A lot of people don't go to websites anymore. Right, but, right. Yeah, we'll post the social media links and everything yeah. on the on the video. And then that way Absolutely. folks can check them out. All right, man. Thank you for your time. Okay, It was man. a blast. Take thank care. You. Right. Bye-bye. Bye.